Uh, we're going to talk about the state of the PHP, but first about me, just a tiny bit. I'm uh, in the IT. I was not always doing the PHP, so I've started with Java Enterprise Edition, then left it for the simplicity of the PHP, and yeah, now it becomes Java again. Uh, <clears throat> I mean the PHP itself. Okay, uh, so I'm writing, speaking, doing open source, and this should be out. Okay, and uh, also I'm uh, the core team member of the YPHP framework, and it's representative in the standards group. Okay, uh, so uh, we're going to talk about the PHP itself. Where is it heading to? Uh, what to learn if we know it's heading in the right or wrong direction? And which framework to choose next if you're tired with the current one? And of course about E, but just a tiny bit. Let's start with this thing, PHP. Um, some stats. Currently, 79% of all the websites are using PHP. That's according to the V3 stats that should be pretty accurate. And 67% of them is using PHP 5. And 32% are using the PHP 7, so we are pretty up to date. Well, there's lots of legacy, but still. It's fourth place in the Redmond rating of languages. I have no idea why, because the PHP standard library is kind of terrible. Who remembers the now, uh, order of arguments of the array functions and string functions by memory? OK, one, two, hmm, three. Not many. <laughs> me, me, me either. <laughs> so the ninth place is the TOB rating. That's a bit different, but overall uh, PHP is currently the second most hated language. Thank you, JavaScript. Yeah, overall PHP usage and popularity actually declines to some degree, because uh, when I did uh, the kind of the similar talk uh, like two years ago, it was 80 something percent, so it declines just a tiny bit, I guess because of the aesthetic website generators that report just it's not made by with any programming language, right? It's just HTML. But it's still one of the most popular languages, and I guess it will stay like so in the next 20 years or so. Okay, uh, where is it PHP heading to? That's a good question. And first, a bit about languages in general. What's the difference between these languages? Well, it's users. Different users choose really different languages. The, there are novices, there are specialists, there are professionals. Novices are usually changing, choosing their own language, but, uh, well, what's the difference? Well, there are almost no all-stars IT teams when it comes to real business, and, yeah, usually you need a language for novices. Why? Because, uh, Novices need frames. Novices need uh, really strict frames, or else there should be a guy that watches them constantly. Yeah, they need frames. Frames means limitations and the guidance. And they need strictness, because uh, with a non-strict language, like the PHP was for a long, long time, it's easy to do really, really messy stuff that is really hard to debug afterwards. And devices need, of course, examples. In this part, PHP really shines with the uh, manual and the comments behind these pages. So, um, I think that Java is for devices based on this criteria. Python is for experienced because it's easy to do a mess with Python and JavaScript, it's awesome. Yeah. Um, Features are a bit less important, and we're more assembling in the, at least in the web world, rather than developing, except maybe a domain. When it comes to really big product projects, product type, well, the domain is everything, and the libraries you choose and assemble it, it's like just nothing. If you need performance, well, PHP does not shine there yet, uh, well, as if pointed in the first day that it will eventually, 
get better and better and better and probably will replace many other languages uh, we use with PHP. But currently, if you need some, something to perform really fast, you usually take the Golang and do it as a microservice, and that's fine. But you keep your domain in the PHP because the domain description in the Golang is pretty bad. Well, the paradigm is important. Uh, if you choose the wrong paradigm, then it may go really bad. But it, it doesn't matter much about the language itself. If, if there are two languages with the same paradigm, they're OK. PHP improved over years, and let's see how, how it goes. Well, the PHP version's adoption is like this. This is from the uh, packages blog from the composer. Um, yeah. And well, the adoption is pretty good. The PHP 7 is adopted well, so we can say that the people are moving towards, towards the future quite fast, and the libraries follow. In the PHP 7, uh, there are many changes, like the performance, more exceptions, return types and scalar type hints, assert, security, and many other changes. And the red ones are uh, adding more strictness to the language. So uh, before the PHP 7, there were less exceptions. It was uh, working with the errors in the way that let's correct this stuff and maybe it will work. But yeah, it does more harm than good. So that, that's more strictness. The next version is like two points more strictness again. And the nullable types is making it a bit less strict. Then the next version is object S type hint less strict. There's nothing in PHP 7.3 regarding that. And then type properties is a bit more strictness again, and improved type variance is a bit less strictness. So uh, I was talking with uh, Nikita Popov, who is a big fan of strictness and who is actually doing most of these changes about strictness. And he said that I would change PHP to the totally strict language if I would be alone working on that. But there, there are other people who are keeping the dynamic part of it. And I think the balance is pretty much good. Well, you don't really need to uh, work with the dynamic parts yourself if you're using a framework. But as a framework developer, as a maintainer of the e-framework, well, we need these dynamic parts for doing crazy stuff. Is PHP OK? Yes, it is. It is OK. It can be uh, used to develop really large project that's not up. And yeah, PHP is somewhere between for devices and for fun. So um, yeah, it, it, the, this point could be shifted by the framework used. So if you use something like the Symfony, it becomes for more suitable for the teams where the one person is like a super senior leader, but he has no time to control all, all his team. That consists of like 20 juniors and yeah, clean up the, all the mess. So he chooses the really strict framework like Symfony and it all goes quite well. If you choose something like, I don't know, well, Codeigniter, then you can uh, express yourself quite well. It's, well, inside it's uh, really, I don't know, so-so framework, a bit messy, but it works, and it has excellent documentation, the best one still, I think. Really simple, and you can do literally anything. But if you know what you're doing, you're okay. If you don't know, well, a disaster. So uh, it's okay even with uh, these flexible frameworks, because uh, if the team lead has resources to watch the team, then it, it should be fine. Usually, the more flexible frameworks are allowing prototyping faster. Like you, you can do the messy prototype really fast in a day. And with a really strict framework, it takes time to prepare that. Afterwards, if you throw away the prototype, it's fine because you, you've uh, actually um, proved the business needs and can rewrite it with something more suitable. Um, 
Infrastructure of PHP is great. I think Composer is one of the best package managers out there. Uh, it's much better than uh, Node.js NPM, and it's on par of, with uh, something like the Java package managers. PHP is stateless by default. That's a con and a pro. A con is that uh, it initializes all the time. It, the execution time is not good because of that, but the really good pro is that even the really messy projects that, well, written without, the, without thinking about the scalability, without thinking about working on the multiple service, it's easy to fix that by just eliminating the session in files, moving it to somewhere to Redis, just scale it to multiple servers, add in the load balancer, and it just works out of the box. It scales really well. And that's good enough language for the domain because the object-oriented programming part is done almost OK. I'm missing still a few things for Java, such as the package visibility and friendly packages, but that's fine. So what to learn? If you are using PHP, uh, maybe just starting PHP, I don't think it's a good idea to learn framework and PHP in the first well, in, in the first, uh, primarily. Yeah. Uh, so learn what you can use anywhere. So if the thing applies to like Python, PHP, Java, everywhere, that's a good thing to learn. So uh, of course, it, it's the object-oriented programming and object-oriented design. You can check yourself with the two words. These are cohesion and coupling. If you know what it is, if you know how that applies, then you should be good. If you have no idea or not sure, continue reading the good but complicated books by the Robert Martin and Martin Fowler. It's, of course, the protocols, because we are developing for web. It's HTTP, HTTPS, and, uh, well, the rest that is, sits on top of that. It is security. Well, um, I'm actually sometimes talking about security, and security in the development world is a mess. No company actually cares about security because it, uh, before it's kind of too late. It, it's easy to hack most of the companies and people are not hacking these companies just because they are not valuable enough. Okay, uh, the SQL, of course, and the CAP theorem, that's about the storages, consistency, availability, and partition tolerance, and as well as basic understanding of algorithm complexity. It's good if you can look at the code and say the annotation of that, but if you cannot, it's at least required to understand that because of the, most of the data structures are uh, annotated with the complexity number and you need to understand what that is to write code efficiently. Well, in PHP, that's not a huge problem because there are little data structures like arrays that are not really arrays inside, they're hash maps. Uh, there are actually uh, actual arrays, the SPL array, but yeah, no one uses that. It's not handy. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, and also refactoring, and of course Linux, because we host all our software under Linux. But I said that the, this should be the first thing you learn, but you should not forget about the framework you use and the PHP itself, of course, because they are. That's what you use daily. Uh, yeah, business needs. Business needs actually more than that. So if you uh, just learn how to code, how to develop things, that's not enough. So business needs predictability uh, because they need to plan, they need performance. And the, well, the performance is both the performance of the execution of the code and performance on how fast you develop. And that's the only thing developers usually uh, improve, and they, they usually don't care about all the, these other skills. Uh, the yeah, adequate cost, well, adequate cost is something uh, that you can always negotiate. The contract you receive is not the final contract. You can propose your own, always. Do it, do it, try it next time you will choose the next place of work and just propose something insane number there is a chance you'll get accepted and we'll be really happy. Yeah, um, 
its ability to use, express yourself clearly, uh, there is a good sign if you can write and express yourself in the language that you can uh, write a really clean, expressive code as well. Uh, its ability to write dirty code quickly, unfortunately. Yes, that's the reality of the business. They sometimes require you to write the code you, you'll be ashamed of, really ashamed of. So in some cases, that's called technical debt, and it should be cleaned up afterwards, but usually we have no time, right? Yeah, uh, its ability to, to estimate that comes with experience and desire to learn new things, preferably in your own time, not the paid time, right? Okay, so which framework to choose next? What do we have? We have lots of frameworks for PHP. That's a good thing. It's not a single framework platform like something like Rails or the Python one, the Django. So we have Laravel, we have Symfony, we have Y2, we have CakePHP, CodeIgniter, Zen Framework, React, Falcon, Fuel, Slim F3, and other micro frameworks. And okay, let's start with Laravel. It's the best marketed framework in the world currently, I think. The Taylor did a really good job at presenting it, at doing the conferences, and actually to make it sustainable via the foundation, via the uh, extra services. So that's the part done right. Yes, secret priorities similar to Apple, that's fun. So he, with each layer con, he gets the stage and announces new cool things he was working on secretly. It is sometimes questionable in community relations, but recently there were no such occurrences. It was a long time ago when it was in the version 3, version 4, and the 5.0 early versions but now it's okay, and it's mostly all right. There are actually no frameworks that are silver bullet. If the framework author says so, that's not really true. All the frameworks currently are okay, except maybe some. But all the frameworks that got enough user base are fine. You can develop with these perfectly. The Symfony is a, it, it's a framework that has a really strong limitations, I mean, the really strong frames, that's perfect if you have a really huge project that should survive like 10 years, and you have a team that, well, at the start at least, they have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. With the Symfony, there will be less chance to get in trouble. Uh, the performance issues of the framework are being solved by caching and compiling. That's fine, but uh, there are extreme cases like the system called Aura CRM, well, the, the, there is a thing called compiler passing symphony. So when it executes, it pre-compiles some code and then executes really fast. And this Aura CRM uses it a lot, and it's like the config-driven development. You're choosing some new settings in the config, then pressing F5, and then waiting for three minutes when the PHP compiles into PHP with the PHP, yes. Okay. Uh, it's really better if the cache works well, uh, and if it doesn't, debug is not really easy. Uh, there are many layers of indirection. Yeah, and actually, um, do you know how the brain works? We can hold like four or five things in the brain at the same time, and all the, these layering in the, in the object-oriented design and object-oriented programming are about uh, keeping the number of these objects to four or five. And the issue with the introducing layers is that sometimes we're doing the layers with the four or five items, but there are too many layers. And in this case, we cannot hold all these layers in the memory again, and that's a big problem. That's much harder to refactor that than, yeah, than, well, making things flat is more complicated than making the really messy code a good code. Yeah. And, well, uh, there are many layers, so style is similar to Java and Spring, that's good and bad. Well, I left Java because of that, uh, to the PHP, then the Symfony and all these trendy things emerged. So I don't know how to feel, probably not so happy. Well, since recently uh, it's following Laravel features, that's what I dislike, 
but uh, the team are very good uh, people. So recently I've complained about the contracts package that it uh, contains the contracts for the totally unrelated things like cash, like the uh, in translation in the single package. Um, well, I proposed the RFC and they said we'll divide that. That's perfect. It, it's very good sign when the community responds and the, the, yeah, the guys are doing good with the community. So Zen Framework was really similar to Symfony but with a different style in the version two. Now it's becoming a thing called Laminas because of the, yeah, Zen is dismissed kinda about the framework and about the development of the PHP. Oh yeah, not so bright future, but luckily it went really okay. And the currently Zen framework is providing a micro framework called Expressive, that's really a good thing. And it can run in the event loop, uh, responding really fast, but it's, uh, well, you have to assemble the full framework yourself. That's good and bad thing. The Falcon, you know, uh, anybody knows the Falcon framework? Yay, cool, many. So it's the thing written in a special language that compiles to C, then it compiles to the just the bytecode. And it has way better performance without the event loop, but you cannot dig into it easily because when debugging, it runs into the C code and you have no idea what happens inside. And it's not so easy to contribute to. But that could be a good choice if you need like super extra performance without worrying about the event loop and stuff. The React PHP is great for async daemons, but, uh, well, recently I've actually tried doing a project with uh, this thing. It's okay, but there is a better one uh, that's not in the slide that's called AM PHP. Uh, that one is done properly with a non-blocking input everywhere, and it's, uh, they are actually checking if anything in the framework is blocking and just erroring if it blocks. Well, if you want a website, there is no better choice than these two. I know the, yeah, you, you're smiling because of the WordPress code and the Drupal code, maybe. Well, Drupal is adopting Symfony recently. Yeah, uh, and some studios create their own CMSs with the framework, that's fine as well. So what do you really need from a framework? It should be enjoyable, and that's it. Should be enjoyable, and you should uh, have a good community, but it all come to this. And what about framework, no framework approach? That's a big trend last years. Like, you don't need a framework. You can assemble anything you want from the libraries, but do you have enough experience and time to do that? Because it takes time. It takes uh, really experience. If you, you should know what you're doing. And you'll build a, build a framework anyway. That's OK. You will have a framework, but your own framework. Each library is fine by itself. It may be even a better library than the one that comes with the Laravel or Symfony or the E framework, because that's a single library the people are focusing on. That's fine. Uh, but how about like 10 libraries using together? There are 10 different authors of these libraries. So all these are made with a different style, different naming, and different conventions. And when this accumulates, like the, you have 30 libraries, and all these are messy because, well, these are okay by themselves, but they are messy together because that's a different style, different style of the calls, et cetera, et cetera. You can, of course, uh, write some decorators to make it the kind of similar style, but it takes time. The next question is how to teach your team? Because, yeah, well, who wants to write some docs? And who loves to write some docs? Please raise your hands. No hands. One. OK. Good for you. <laughs> um, so about the documentation, no one really wants to write that. And the, most of the full stack frameworks have a pretty good documentation about what's inside. So uh, in order to teach your team, you can just give them documentation, maybe uh, make a learning session. But that's fine. And also deadlines. Deadlines are always yesterday. Uh, well, try it. Because uh, trying to build your own framework really teaches you how all the frameworks work. That's uh, definitely a good thing to do, but not with a production project, please. Well, we succeeded in making a framework. 
Yes, we did. That's, um, yeah, last thing is don't get stuck with a single language or the framework. Because if you like, um, for example, Laravel, try learning Symfony. You'll learn something new and will be able to get it back to the Laravel and apply it. The same comes with the Vue, and it's even better that you'll choose a new language or a new platform. Like, uh, after developing with PHP, you can uh, get into the mobile development, something like the Android with Java, and you'll get a bit crazy at first because there are threads. It's like multi-something. It, it has blocking. It has conflicts. It has uh, concurrency problems. But the reality is that it, it all will be really required when you uh, work on a project that has really heavy traffic because all these blocking, et cetera, et cetera, will be there. So about the Yee framework, yes. Ah, it's the PHP MVC framework. The MVC word, uh, MVC abbreviation is not that popular nowadays. The people are calling it ADR just for the sake of calling it differently. Yeah, it, it allows really rapid development. Uh, it, uh, well, you can get from the MVP to support and development. That means you don't have to throw away your MVP. Well, if you're good enough doing a good MVP, not the really shitty one. Uh, lots of features out of the box. It's flexible. It's uh, kind of pragmatic. It allows taking shortcuts. So if you're creative, you can do a really creative mess. And it's not commercial. Well, it was originally created by the Chinese guy. Uh, his name is uh, hardly to pronounce it. It's Tian Zue. Yeah, I've learned that. Uh, it, it was in 2008, and it's based on his Predator framework from 2004. So it's, the framework has a really, really, really long history. It was created, to, well, it originates from the same time the Rails was created. So yeah. Uh, some stats, we have like 12, almost 13,000 stars at GitHub and some good numbers in the Facebook group, at Slack, etc. And, well, we have uh, some e-values that we stick to. That's why it's a bit different than other software. We are being practical, so high performance in both execution and uh, the development of the code is our priority. We're doing the sensible defaults, uh, that's convention over configuration, same as Rails, but we prefer no magic. So uh, we're oriented to the practice. If uh, some kind of a standard is not really working as it should in the real browsers, etc., we are following the browsers, not the standard. Well, that's fine, because you really need to do things right now, not waiting when the browsers or something will implement the standard. We have been helpful, so uh, simple, well, it, it gets complicated in some areas, but that's because it cannot be done otherwise. So we're trying to keep that simple. Uh, we're being explicit, consistent, and yeah, that's all the values. Same as with every framework, E has its pros and cons. It, it's about the every framework. There are some pros, some cons, some different styles. And yeah, using all uh, one framework is better for one project, using another framework is better for another project. So uh, it's red, so you can develop fast, but at the same time, uh, it allows you to develop fast. That means you can do really rapidly a prototype, and in many cases, people are not doing the prototype with a proper architecture in the first place, like generating tons of code, then uh, showing it to the clients, and we're almost done and then spending like half a year to make it perfect. Well, that's bad, bad for them, but yeah, you should not really do it like that. Never, never set the expectations of the client too high. That's a bad thing to do. So uh, it's not too strict. So th that is what he is criticized for a lot, for allowing doing bad things. Really bad things like the accessing the global state, and yeah, doing not so good things. We, we have the thin abstractions. That means that we have no many layers, and if you get inside the method and read the code, it just reads, it's just code. 
Uh, it's not like the factory calls something uh, with a container, et cetera, et cetera. You get the ID instantly. Well, it, it is sequential. Well, uh, th that's the thing I'm really missing in the many libraries and frameworks, the sequentiality. It is when you get to the method, it's not necessarily a really long method, but there are calls that are really sequential. There are no, like, th throwing an event and no idea what happens next. It, it's all sequential. It has fairly good naming. It could be better. Now we're developing uh, the third version, and we're naming it even better. It's easy to read and easy to debug because of that. You're just uh, setting the debugger and working the steps and understanding what happens inside. The performance is on par with the micro frameworks. That's wonderful because it, it's a like, full-featured framework, but it works really, really fast. But it uh, works great without cache. So without cache, it works like the Symfony with cache, maybe a bit slower. With cache, it works really well, but I'm not a fan of turning on cache because the cache is the, one of the most complicated problems in the computer science, right? Well, invalidating it. It's true. It's true when the cache stacks. It's a disaster. Uh, we have the G. It's a code generation thing. And I think he is still the only framework that did it right. So I, I've seen the code generation for Symfony. I've seen the code generation for Laravel. But uh, these are kind of not really good. So people are tend to avoid it. In the E, people tend to use it. It has templates. So uh, I've seen many projects that the well, the studios and the um, well companies that do client projects are uh, writing custom templates for the generator and then just uh, select some things like title of the project in the form that press generate and the project is done. Almost. Then they take like a month to do it right, but yeah. Um, then grids and data providers, that's a good thing for admin panels. You're feeding it the uh, active record and it just uh, displays you the, all the fields. You can edit that, delete, edit, and rename, etc. That's good. And the docs. We, we, are, we are documenting everything, every method, everything with a PHP doc. Well, except the code itself, because it should be self-explanatory. So that's the exception. That's really helpful. I don't know if you can see the little icons, but there is a uh, very helpful one that's called Stack Overflow It. So you're pressing it, and it searches the Stack Overflow with the exception title instantly. We're Stack Overflow developers, yay. Um, that's the debug panel. That's quite similar to what the Symfony currently has. So it, it records your requests and responses. And you can uh, check the logs, um, check the profiling, the database queries, et cetera, et cetera. That's an I think. That's the code generator, so it can, it can generate models. Uh, well, the, these CRUDs for admin panel, controllers, forms, models, extensions, everything. Yeah, and well, the console, our own, not the Symfony one. Um, we're actually thinking about switching to the Symfony one because it takes time to maintain that, and the Symfony one is good. Uh, so we, with the E2, there, there were some mistakes. We tried to handle too much uh, and got too much into the core. Well, the original founder of that, the Tian Duya, was really a crazy guy that, that spe who spent every day like three to four hours working on the framework. So we thought it's all good to take lots and lots of things on board and do it, implement it at the same time. We did, so the second version of the framework can do crazy things like the active record can work with the one model is like the MySQL, MySQL, and the second model is Redis, the third model is MongoDB, and there are relations between the, them, and it's all transparently supported. That's crazy, but it works, yes. So we t took the, even the jQuery, PJX, CAPTCHAs, MySQL inputs, more client side weird stuff on board, and uh, we really not able to maintain all that currently. So we are dropping some stuff in the version three. We tried to fix PHP with magic. Yay, that's a good mistake. Good and bad thing. 
So the PHP allows you to set uh, really random properties to objects and it works. Without any exception, it just creates a property. So if you make a typo, you won't see it because before it's like too late and it errors somewhere else. You have to debug it as a visitor. We didn't like that behavior and we were really um, inspired by the C-sharp properties, so we implemented that with the magic methods, the get and set, and is set. Yeah, uh, but we, the, there was a side effect of that, because it was made like as the class named object. Yeah, that's weird naming, and we had to rename it afterwards because the object uh, name was reserved later. But the effect was that uh, we created a huge inheritance tree. Everything was inherited from this object and then the component, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that made it not really easy to test. So the test, tests for the E framework are looking a bit different. They, we, they, they, we have like a special framework uh, for the testing for mocking this stuff. It's not really straightforward. Well, it works. You can do it. But we are trying to get rid of uh, all these things in the version 3. We handled errors PHP way. The PHP is not strict about errors. It tries to correct that. And we thought, well, it's a PHP way, so we are going to follow that. So we tried to correct errors and that sometimes make it error elsewhere. And it, it's not easy to deal with that. We haven't used many PSRs, but that's understandable because the framework originates from a long, long time ago, and most of the PSRs were not even there at that time. Well, we did a framework release, uh, but uh, there were like backwards compatibility things, backwards compatibility promise, and we have not adopted many, many PSRs yet. We're doing it currently. And yeah, old style architecture, that's what allows it to run really, really fast, but it's, it's a service locator. It's a service locator and the, the, there is a dependency injection component, but it's not used for the core itself. Yeah, but it runs fast because of that. It's really simple because of that. What's next? We're doing the version three. Currently, we really want to finish that before the end of the year. I'm not sure we'll make it, but we'll try. And it's a set of packages. It is a set of packages, like there, there is a logger, there is dependency injection, the proper one, that can work with the, any object easily. That's one of the best in translation layers and default application that combines all that. It allows both the classic MVC and DDD style stuff. Well, the, by DDD style, I mean that uh, in the object-oriented design, you are supposed not to name things by, but by the type. It's like the bad thing to put controllers into the controllers directory, views into views directory, models into the models directory. And you should really use namespaces to describe the, your use case and put the entry points there, not in the controllers directory. So uh, it will allow that. The routing is quite flexible. Uh, we are following the principles like the solid grasp, et cetera. Well, with some exceptions where it doesn't make sense. Uh, we're adopting the PSRs, such as the HTTP request response. That's really a great one. Uh, middleways, container events. And we are trying at the same time not to make it complicated and not to, for, not to make it look magical. We're using the strict typing, keeping most good things from E2, except the bad things that we took on board by accident. Well, yeah, um, we are killing most of the inheritance. By the way, the inheritance, uh, well, it produced lots and lots of wrapping extensions, like tons of wrapping extensions. I think the Yi is the framework that has most number of extensions. It's like the thousands of extensions that are just wrapping the things you can really use directly, but it's not convenient. Yeah, and it can run in the both event loop but it won't be really efficient because there are blocking operations. It's not the asynchronous framework. It's a standard one. And the Roadrunner. Anyone aware of the Roadrunner? Yay, some people. So the uh, Roadrunner is the uh, server written in the Golang. It's like the uh, PHP FPM. So it creates a pool of processes that are working with a request response, but it's really different. You heard about the preload thing? 
in the recent PHP, it preloads the classes for, for the autoload. But Roadrunner makes it one step further, so it preloads the framework and the framework state as well. Then it takes the PSR 7 standard and makes the uh, created request and response processed in a worker with the endpoint. But the uh, whole framework is preloaded and already there. So your request is destroyed. The process is still destroyed. You don't have to care about the leaks much. But it responds with the database query with some logic is in like the five milliseconds at max. That's a really, really cool thing. So yeah, we need your help. Uh, you can find the uh, framework at the GitHub in the ESOF. Recently, we've created very, very many packages. And uh, you can choose the package you want. Uh, you can reuse some without the framework. These are now framework agnostic. Or you can just try the version 2. That's still OK. And it has really good performance. And it will be maintained for the like, next five years, for sure. So we accept bugs, feedback, ideas, and code. Thank you very much. And now that's question time. Okay, let's see. Do we have questions over Slido? Question. Oh yeah, we do. We have. Oh we yeah. Have oh yeah. Fire as well. E 1.1 for the very large projects. Okay, 500 models. Woo, that's big. Custom framework changes. I hope these are not in the vendor directory. Yeah. And we plan to move to E2. Should we wait for E3? That depends. That depends. That really depends. Uh, well, maybe. Maybe. The, if you want to migrate, I, I need to know the reason. And if the reason is like uh, it won't be maintained or something, that's fine. We're still applying the security fixes for the E1.1. And we're still applying the uh, PHP 7 fixes, so it's compatible. You can work with that. The E1.1 actually powers quite a lot of projects nowadays that are still OK. And more than that, the, any old enough project is actually abstracting from the framework. It tends to do so with the microservices, with all these things. And if you haven't done that, try doing that beforehand, you will be able to switch to any framework at any time, including the E2 and E3. Uh, well, you just need to extract the services and the domain layer into separate layers. Then the, aha, uh -huh, the next question. MVC, as a concept, is getting old. Yes, it's not trendy. OK, never intended for the web. Oh, it, that depends. The original MVC term is not the same as MVC that is uh, meant for the web. It's it, just the same letters, same terms, but the different, really different meaning. OK. What do you think about the middleware frameworks and why the adoption rate of PSR 515 is too low, so low? Well, it's fairly new. That's why it's so low. I think it was released. Uh, later last year, right? I don't know. Uh, I think the middleware frameworks are good. Uh, first of all, because you can uh, reuse these standard middlewares for the authentication for the um, server uh, tokenless sessions for the really tricky things, like the sending the tricky headers for the content security policy and stuff like that. And I'm really fond of middlewares, and the E version 3 will use the middlewares stack as well. So that, that's a really good idea, really good thing to do. And I think the adoption rate will raise eventually. But not with the top two popular frameworks, I guess, because they have the backwards compatibility promise already. Uh, is E still have problems with the Ajax calls? Mm, yes. Uh, we've adopted this library called PJAX. Uh, it was uh, developed for the GitHub originally. And yes, it has problems. It has problems if you want to do uh, multiple areas with the PJAX on the same page. And uh, yeah, it behaves really weird. 
I have no idea how the GitHub guys managed to work the GitHub like that, because it has lots of areas that reload sometimes. So if you use it with the, like, the second uh, single page, it's fine. If you uh, want multiple sections and complicated logic, it's much better to write your own JavaScript code that's not so bad in the e framework. That's fine. Active record or data mapper? Huh. Both. <laughs> I like both. So the, um, I worked uh, the last one year and a half with the doctrine that was used with the, both the e framework and Symfony, and I love it and hate it. I love the data mapper, how it maps the data, but I really, really hate the entity manager because it stacks and it leaks. It leaks like crazy and it, sometimes it stacks with the transaction failed and uh, it's really hard to go on from that. So yeah, uh, well, and also the data mapper pattern uh, turns you away from the structure of your database. I was, uh, the early step of my ca career, I was a DBA working for this company called Siemens, and they have a really huge databases with the high loads, et cetera, et cetera, and the, how the schema is done, how the types are chosen, how the uh, relations are chosen, indexes, et cetera, was really, really important. And we were getting uh, projects for the support. There were uh, multiple every week, and there were like, you know what Hibernate is, the Java library that Doctrine was modeled after? Yeah, so uh, there were like normal projects that were started from the database, these were okay to work for, for uh, with, and there was like the Hibernate projects. And when the Hibernate projects was around, we were like, oh, Hibernate again, mess. Yeah, and the same with Doctrine. It, it, it's okay if your project is not really big enough, but if your project is getting big, the schema generated from your models is usually not enough. It may miss indexes, it may miss the optimal data types. Uh, if you map it directly, it kinda may work, but Doctrine has a really, really huge performance penalty. Uh, in some cases, it's preferable to use the uh, query builder, or even the SQL, that's fine. Just don't get it to the stored procedures, never. Don't do it. Okay, uh, there is also a, a new ORM that's called Cycle that you should watch for. It, the documentation is not ready, but it's really, really promising from the author of the, this Roadrunner async framework. So he runs that in the async environment. It has a pretty good query builder. And the thing is that it does, should not leak by design. I'm not sure it leaks, but it should not, because he runs it into the production in the really, really leak-unfriendly environment. So, okay, uh, sequential versus events. I have seen events being over-misused heavily lately. When do you think every events should be the way to go? Aha, uh -huh. events versus sequential. I prefer sequential if it's possible. If you have no need for events, don't introduce them. When you need events, you will know so, I think. Well, events are okay if you want to decouple uh, some projects, some pieces of code into models. So when you uh, have no idea who will react to the one thing, that who will subscribe to your uh, code and will reuse it, then use event. If you uh, have a clear idea or the number of subscribers is low, prefer sequential execution because events are a mess. If they are overused, that's, the project is a hell, really hell to work with. Yeah, I think that was the last question. Anyone in, the, in here want some question with a mic or just voicing yourself? No. Okay, thank you very much for listening. Oh, another one, wait, 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 wait. wait. Favorite sources to learn from? Hmm. How to discriminate the hype from something to stay? Okay, don't believe hype. Hype is just hype. Uh, but tr try all the hypey things for uh, yourself, and you should be able to distinguish what really works from what doesn't work. 
favorite sources to learn from? Um, hmm. Open source. I li li like the open source libraries. I like the um, frameworks. But uh, it's really hard to get into. You should uh, probably start with the documentation. So contributing as the documentation fixes, documentation translation, is the best way to get the, into the open source to learn about the library and, well, actually see if the documentation matches the, what happens actually. Because in many cases, that's not really true. Documentation lies. Yeah, not in the e framework. We're trying to keep it in a good state. Okay, that was the last one, I guess. Thank you.